first of all, I'm just reading your biography from your website, and you have had an astonishing career in music. I mean, from Elia Kazan to Thelonious Monk to Johnny Depp to Jack Kerouac to, I mean, you, you've, you have worked with some of the, the iconic names of the 20th century, music and, and literature yeah. and the arts. So I'm just wondering now, at, at this point in your career, what, where are you at with your, with your music and your creativity? Are you still writing? Or what's, uh, what's, you know, yeah, what are you up to? Uh, at the moment, two new pieces. One is called American, Three American Love Stories, and, and they're based on characters in a wonderful book by Willa Cather, a wonderful woman author in the really the first, early, very early 20th century. And then the second is by a Zora, Z O R A, Neil, N E A L E, Hurst, the great uh, African American woman novelist and writer and poet in the 1930s. And then uh, the, the, the third one will be for two, uh, a love story that is in Jack Kerouac's On the Road. And there are, there are three authors whose work I love. And it's for uh, uh, violin, alto, saxophone, and piano. But it's going to be premiered October 2nd. <clears throat> so I'm getting nervous because I have to, <laughs> have, to get, have to get it finished in, in Germany. And then, and then I'm writing another, another piece after that. My next one is, is for violin, cello, and orchestra, a, yeah. a double concerto. And that, that's going to be premiered in the, I think, around June of 2018. Okay. Orchestra. So that, that's kind of like composing has always been kind of my, my gyroscope in music. So when I'm up till 5 o'clock in the morning, you know, playing with a background for an inner drummer at a folk festival or, or playing the penny whistle or playing the piano or playing the French horn or playing with the jazz or Cajun or, or folk musicians. All those, exp I, I, when I play with my jazz group or when I guest conduct orchestras and I do all the different things that I do, that's all related to what I do when I just sit down in a quiet room with nobody around and just write the music because it, it, it continues to enrich my life and at the same time, being able to be at things like the Mariposa Festival, which I loved since yeah. I first played in 1974, doing doing events like these wonderful folk festivals is, is among other things, it's very rewarding and very good for your health because it makes you feel so good that I think it's actually beneficial. And all, all I ever dreamed of was to be able to do something in music someday. And it was so far from what I ever dreamed I'd be able to be involved in. <clears throat> you know, when I was a little boy in Feasterville, Pennsylvania, population 200. And there's a wonderful picture. Now so, sorry, what was the place? Of me milking a cow when I was seven yeah. years old. And that was my, <laughs> that was my, my first uh, bio picture. We used to milk by hand, so I had the tail right under my leg. <laughs> What was the name of the place? I didn't catch it. It was called Feasterville. F-E-A-S-T-E-R-D-I-L-L-E. -E. Okay. And so how did you go from Feasterville to and to get into music? Actually, my uncle was a merchant seaman, and he took me to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra in Philadelphia. And then he took me to hear Duke Ellington's orchestra also playing. And I loved both of them. And because he had also traveled around the world, he you know, would always tell me different kinds of music and different instruments to think about and that languages and music were different all over the world and then my other uncle was uh, from Las Vegas New Mexico, not Las Vegas okay. but around the turn of the century he grew up with all native people his family had a junkyard and was right in the neighborhood where a lot of native people would come to gather and so he was brought up learning so much about that he told me and taught me all different kinds of songs and things that he learned even though he wasn't Indian himself and then my father and mother loved, equally loved jazz and Brahms so if I would hear a great jazz group on the radio they would think that that was going to be a path towards degradation and at the same time they encouraged me to listen to the wonderful classical broadcasts that you could hear and at that time AM radio was really magical. They just had so many different kinds of fantastic music, folk music and jazz and chamber music, orchestral music and opera. And you could hear all these things on AM radio for yeah, free. Yeah. And then across the street there was a gas station where I used to mow the lawn. They would have country music concerts there and I would go because I was the lawn, the person who mowed the lawn, I was, I was allowed to go as a little boy to hear that music. Then we, we found 
family moved from the farm during World War II, and my father and mother both went to work for the government during the war effort. And we moved from a 160-acre farm to a tiny place in what they call a checkerboard neighborhood in Washington, D.C., where white and black people all lived together, even though it was still officially segregated, because it was in the South, even though it was the nation's capital. And there I heard constantly this, all this incredible music day and night. So without realizing it, I was getting a whole kind of a picture of so many different kinds of musics. And then when I got my own little basement apartment at the age of 19, I would have these jam sessions of people. I was people from the, the National Symphony and classical players and jazz players and people who worked for different embassies from different countries would all come and bring their instruments. So I, I, without knowing it, I was actually getting a whole picture of a lot of the music and languages and places around the world. Then years later, when I finally got to the Mariposa Festival, the way Estelle Klein organized that with those workshops, I suddenly saw a way of how to take everything that I've learned just picking things up here and there and organize them so that I could apply that wonderful way that's part of that folk tradition to everything that I do. So that was that was um, instrumental in, in your your later musical development then, the, the Mariposa oh, experience. And, and yeah. it wasn't really until I was already 43 years old the first time I played Mariposa. But when I actually... Uh, started guest conducting more and more symphony orchestras the 14 years I worked with the Toronto Symphony during the Young People's Programs and the Montreal Symphony and the, and the Brooklyn Philharmonic like for 29 years, I was able to, to apply those ideas of what you learn in folk music presentations in concerts without boring young people or talking them to death yeah. by showing the, the beautiful folk instruments and the antecedents of the modern orchestra, and also the folk influences of these beautiful pieces that composers had written. And conversely, when I do a jazz festival, I would also do something to show the folk roots of that. And that's because Odette had told me folk music is the root of the tree. And it's so wonderful to see how the, the, the folk festivals now are including all kinds of music from around the world. Because when I first went to the folk festivals and they were they were playing Michael Rowe, your boat is sure. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> which, which I love. I was considered to be kind of someone from another planet when I bring all these different instruments from around the world that were also folkloric instruments that I'd learned, but which weren't part of the what was considered to be the folk music scene of that time. Now when I go to these festivals, they have so many different kinds of music that when I play, I play an Irish slip jig or a, a traditional piece or play some Woody Guthrie songs. Rather than being the man from outer space, I'm sort of now like an old folky <laughs> in comparison because yeah. I never abandoned those beautiful traditional kinds of folk music. I was just interested in other ones. And it's, it's great to see now that young people who have such a, a broad scope, you know, such a, a beautiful viewpoint, and realize that all these musics, each, and I think that the being at the folk festivals, especially like Mariposa, benefits the people who play them as much as it does to the mm -hmm. people who come to listen. Because we all learn and we all share and we all have a good time. So can you tell us what uh, you're planning in terms of uh, your Mariposa performance? What uh, type of material you might be, you well, might be performing? I, I, or do you, do you decide that week closer to the day? A series of ideas for workshops. Yeah. And I'll bring as many instruments as I can fit in without excess baggage. I'll have less clothes and more instruments. And then I'll just show up. And whatever it is that I'm assigned to do, I'll do my very best and enjoy playing and listening and jamming with all the musicians. And there'll be a lot of, young, of newer people that you always get to see at these festivals. Generally now, when I go to the, some of those festivals, I look for a table where a lot of people with white hair are sitting <laughs> yeah. around. And then we all kind of stare at each other. And then they say, don't I know you? And I said, yes, I'm David Amram's grandfather. <laughs> and it's a wonderful way to have a kind of reunion. But then I also meet some of these 20-year-old geniuses that can yeah. play and do everything so well and are grounded in, in not only the roots of so many traditional folk styles, but also have a knowledge of, of jazz and, mm -hmm. and other music from around the world and are just gifted and love doing it 
and are not angry because of the fact that it's not a uh, great industrial field of endeavor, but already are mature enough to see how satisfying it is just to be able to do something that pleasurable and share it with other people. Now, you play pretty much every instrument under the sun. Well, I could describe myself as the remains of a French horn player, and I still love the horn, and I, I have it, and I've written a lot of compositions for a horn, I said, but there's so many other instruments that I've learned and play since then that are more applicable in a company or playing with other genres of folk music that I use the horn as, as part of what I do now. What other instruments are you particularly fond well, of? I play all kinds of flutes and whistles and ocarinas from around the world, yeah. and some double readers just have a beautiful hulus, H-U-L-U-S-I, hulusai, which is a, a wonderful Chinese instrument that's just so gorgeous, I can't I can hardly resist playing that. And I play piano, of course, and yeah. all different percussion instruments from around the world. And when I come there, I'll really do whatever I'm asked to do. And I, I have, all my life, I've always, when I can't bring my own group, but and, and because of the economics, very often I can't travel with my own band. Yeah. Sometimes I come just with my son, who's a great percussionist and, and knows all my stuff. But when I just have to come by myself, I can always find people to play with. So I'm comfortable whether I have to come all by myself and script a band. But essentially, it's this, this all comes from the same place, which is having the music be the star, and you're trying to contribute to the situation by making everybody else feel good, feel appreciated, help when you're needed, and let that wonderful feeling of the music take over the whole situation. And at that point, the music almost tells you what to do. It's, it's amazing, and it happens all the time when you don't wreck it. Um, who have been your greatest influences of the people you've had personal uh, contact with? Well, I would say certainly the great conductor whom I dedicated my first book, Vibrations, to. His name was Dimitri Matropoulos, and he was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, and he used to say to me, how is your friend Dizzy Gillespie? I like his latest harmonic innovation. He was someone who appreciated just about every type of music in the world. And Dizzy Gillespie, that he used to ask you about, of course, was one of, the, one of my great mentors and inspirations, and Charlie Parker, whom I met way back then. And before I met Dizzy in 51, 1951 and Charlie Parker in 1952. And then I have met, I've worked with literally thousands of incredible people. Jack Kerouac loved to sing and play the piano, but he, was, he wouldn't have described himself as a musician. But he was, he was, he really appreciated and loved music and loved people and had a great sense. And just about everyone that I've met and keep meeting had the same effect. When I wrote my flute concerto for James Galway, he made me aware of how important it is when you're playing even the penny whistle or any instrument or singing to try to get a sense of tone because he, he was so conscious of that. And when I go to the Northeast Regional Folk Alliance, they have what's called the Canadian Room. And I go there, go there religiously, and hear so many terrific songwriters and, and, and with people with such a high intellectual and musical level, it makes me glad that we have, have neighbors like that, believe me. And then Odetta, of course, I loved playing playing with her, which I did for so long at Pete Seeger, who I've yeah. since 1948, always encouraged me, as Charlie Parker and Dizzy did, to try to be, if I was going to be a composer, to try to always keep that same sense of balance and purity and expression and honesty that folk music personifies. And if you could do that, you could always do what you were doing essentially from a personal, emotional, spiritual, human, musical point of view and not get confused about what was supposed to be fashionable for two weeks or, or showing how brilliant we were, how brilliant we were, but rather doing something that was, that was saying something. The great Lester Young, another person that was just inspired all of us, he was just such an extraordinary person. And a, a saxophone player came and started playing just kind of to show Lester Young how terrific he was. 
and played about 10 minutes of the world's fastest, loudest, mm-hmm. yeah. pyrotechnical, unmusical ego trip avalanche of combination of the bombing of Hiroshima and Arnold Schoenberg's greatest outtakes. <laughs> and after it was all over and the, the room was almost on fire from all those hot licks, Lester Young looked at him very quietly and said, he said, so that was that was something. Now, tell me your story. I said, "Wow." So I think you know that uh, the, the folk music in this, which is just about any music that that is played from any folks around the world that that does tell a story, is an essence to ground us all and keep us honest, and then keep you curious and also keep you respectful of every person, every music, every musician that crosses your path. I think that's a great place to end the interview. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you so much for this. That's been a great pleasure talking to you. I look forward to maybe meeting you when you're when you're here for the for the festival. Oh, definitely. I'll be I'll be around. I'll be part of the last soldier standing. I just always I should go to bed earlier, but when I get there, it's so much fun. And there's always we're talking about ready to go to bed. Someone says, "Come on, I hear this," and then I go over and then 